Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right. So this is part three of a three-part series on wines from the Gonzalez Bias portfolio. Like all the wines in this series, this is a free sample and I have free reign to review it however I wish. Today's wine comes from Dominio Fournier in the Ribera del Duero part of Spain. I talked a little bit about Spain and its wine laws last week, so feel free to check out that episode uh, for, for that info. Otherwise, let's just get into the region and the winery. First off, this is not to be confused with the, the, the winery with the similarly named Fournier Per Efis uh, in Sancerre. Same last name, but not related, at least as far as I at least as far as in business, who knows? Maybe they're just cousins, whatever. Let's start with the Ribera del Duero D.O. Like Rioja and really much of Spain, wine has been made uh, here since at least the Roman Empire. With that said, the Benedictine monks from Cluny in Burgundy are credited with starting the industry as we know it. Now, I learned a little bit more, more about not necessarily Ribera per se, but in the area. I went to a presentation for another winery that's just outside the Ribera del Duero um, D.O. Um, for various reasons. And uh, they, they, they named a specific um, order of monks. I'll try to remember what it is. It begins with a P, uh, put in the lower third. All right. So I just want to um, give you some additional information. Anyway, the appellation is in the Castilla y Leon Autonomous Community in the western part of Spain. As the name implies, it lines along the Duero River. This river crosses into Portugal and becomes the Duro. Uh, river, home of port wine. Castilla y Leon is the largest of the autonomous community and has a total of 10 DOs and three VCs, or uh, Vino de Calidad con Indicación Geográfica, uh, or quality wine with geographic indication. I kind of rolled off the tongue there for a second. Its climate is continental with hot summers and cold winters. Rain falls about 18 inches per year. Soils cover a wide spectrum of sand, silt, clay, limestone, marl, and chalk. It's a decent elevation overall, ranging from about 750 meters to over 900 meters. In other words, 2,500 feet to 3,000 feet. You've heard that Cab is king? Well, Tempranillo is king here. Approximately 95% of plantings are Tempranillo. It's known by two names here, Tinto Fino and Tinto uh, del Pais, which is how this wine is labeled. Like last week's winery, there's not much as far as history to glean from the website, only that it was founded in 1960. With that said, they do have information concerning their vineyards and production. So uh, they have over 50 hectares of vineyards divided into 22 plots spread across, spread across three larger areas where the winery is. Now, as you can see, these vineyards run along the Duero River. This places them on what is called an alluvial terrace comprised of a topsoil of what they call boulder and gravel. It can kind of remind you of the galets of chateauneuf the pop and retains the heat from the day into the night. This type of soil is free draining and the roots will need to go deep to reach water. The property is 820 meters or about 2,700 feet above sea level and they typically get an annual rainfall of around 400 to 600 millimeters or 15.75 to 23.6 inches. This contributes to a high diurnal shift. This is, uh, this is the difference between the high and the low temperatures for the day. Uh, and what that does is, if I haven't already mentioned it later in the script, what that does is uh, it gets really hot, so you get the sugars get, get, you know, get created in the grape. And then at night, as things cool down, you get a really cool temperature, your acids uh, are now uh, increased. So you're able to retain acidity uh, with grapes uh, because as grapes mature, sugar goes up, acid goes down. Um, but if you have this diurnal shift, that decline in acid isn't as bad and you can create, you can retain acidity, which gives wines a little bit of lift, a little bit of brightness, that type of thing. 
Anyway, the gravel does extend how long warmer temperatures extend into the evening, but due to their higher elevation, it'll cool fairly quickly. For instance, the highs and lows in the week, the highs and lows the week I wrote this script on July 1st, 2024, for the town of Berlangas de Roa, Ro, Roa, Roa, anyway, the closest town to the winery, ranged from 52 degrees Fahrenheit to 93, 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the differences were in the 25 to 30 degree range Fahrenheit for each day. Average sunlight hours are 2,400 uh, hours per year. The vine age for the vineyards ranges anywhere from three to more than 60 years. Most of their vineyards use what is known as the gobele training, or use it as gobele training. Basically, they look like bushes, and that's what this is also known as bush trained vines. Even from the satellite photos, it's easy to see which plots use this training and which use more common methods. Because of this, they have low density and therefore low yields. Yields are no more than 5,000 kilograms per hectare or two, two tons per acre. The philosophy for using low yields is that it creates concentrated grapes, which is expected to increase quality. All the plots are hand harvested. That's pretty much the only way to do globally trained vines, but even the plots that don't use this training method are hand harvested. And that also makes sense since it wouldn't be practical to have a tractor for a small amount of vines. Each parcel is harvested separately and placed into small bins to help ensure the grapes don't start getting crushed before making it to the winery. After that, they are hand sorted. Then the grapes go through fairly standard winemaking practices from what I can from what I can tell, though they make a point in the text sheet that they to say they don't use pumps. After fermentation, wines will age between 12 and 18 months in French and American oak barrels. After the winemaking team will after that the winemaking team will evaluate the barrels and figure out which barrels will go into which wine. And they only make two wines. This one and a reserva. This one doesn't have a specific aging statement on it. It does use the term coseca, which just means that the wine meets the minimum requirements to carry any particular DO. Even if a wine could use a higher aging statement, it's not uncommon for in Spain for a winery to do that, especially for younger wines. Their website shows the 2017 having Crianza on the front label, whereas this one doesn't. You'll find it on the back label instead, like last week's wine, uh, th then that's the same. So I didn't do that from last week, but here you go. So you'll see on the back says Coseca uh, or Cosecha. It's probably Coseca, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, last week's wine, Bronya, also says Coseca or Cosecha. Okay, let's get the stats for this wine. The 2019 Dominio Fournier suggested retail price $29.99. It is from the Ribera del Duero DOC. It's 100% Tinta del Paese or Tempranillo. Soil is alluvial soil with gravel and boulders. Vine age 30 to 60 plus years. Yields 3,000 to 5,000 kilograms per hectare or 1.21 to 2.02 tons per acre. Aging says Coseca. It's 12 months, 90% French oak, 10% American oak. Barrel age, two to four years. In other words, used oak. Uh, bottle, uh, bottled in, it was bottled May 2021. ABV, 14.5%. Total acidity, 5.05 grams per liter. pH, 3.55. And the RS just says less than 2.0 grams per liter. All right, let's get into the wine. I just realized that uh, in, the, in the script, when I was talking about the age, the vines, the ages of the vines for the winery, it said three to over 60 or more than 60. Uh, the text sheet says 30 to 60. Um, I don't know, maybe at some point right now, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know whether or not the, the property is three to 60 plus, or it's 30 to 60. It could be just these plots, which is probably what it is. These plots are 30 to 60. And the reason I say that is there were several like typing typos in the script. So it's possible I meant to type 30 and I only type three. Um, but most of the other typos are just like words that it was like I figured out what I was, you know, what it was supposed to be. And I just redid that part of the script. If you don't know, like, so this is not to... Um, this is not to defend anyone who uses a teleprompter. 
but there have been times over the years when people will criticize others who use teleprompters and they'll be like, well, how did, how can you mess up on the teleprompter? Like, you know, how could you, just, you know, someone will say, well, that's what the teleprompter said. Like, well, how could you just say what's on the teleprompter? Let me tell you when you're, whether you wrote the script or not, the teleprompter is giving you the script. So you're just reading, you're just reading out loud. It's like if a book, if you're, if you know, in class and it's like, Hey, read the next passage aloud, you're going to read what's there. And if it's kind of a weird way of wording things, you're going to stumble over it or weird for you. If it's words you don't understand, you're going to stumble it over it if you haven't pre-read it. Now, while I did write the script like a month ago, um, I haven't reread the script recently. So basically what I'm trying to say is, yeah, people use teleprompters, fine. And those teleprompters, whoever wrote the stuff, it should be perfect, especially when you're talking like newscasters and politicians. For someone like me, yeah, I may have made a mistake here and there. Um, but at the same time, if there is a mistake in the teleprompter, uh, like a word that wasn't supposed to be there, they're going to read it. Just It's just what they're going to do. All right. Enough of that. Let's just get into the wine. First, color. Oh, this is a deep red color. Yeah. Um, as far as like staining, there isn't a ton of staining on the glass. There's a little bit. I'll be honest. I think some of that's from the last, from the last wine. Considering this is Tempranillo, Tempranillo doesn't really uh, stain a lot, but it is, uh, but it is a deep color. Um, sometimes with Tempranillo, it can get a little bit uh, translucent, but it's still a pretty young wine. You usually see that in older wine because the color, Tempranillo for me, color drops out pretty quick and it starts oranging. However, with that said, I did have a 96 um, wine from a winery that's just outside Ribetta. Um, that could have been part of Ribetta, but it, there were no vineyards at the time. They created the DO. And um, it was pretty, it was not quite like this, honestly. But I mean, there was a little bit of browning, a little bit of orange, but it was still, the color was still really good, really, you know, deep. It wasn't thinning out. I was impressed with it. All right. So lots of red fruit going on with this. So raspberry, cranberry, strawberry, got a little blackberry. Got some bramble going on here, metal. I actually had detect a, a touch of caramel, which just might be just random, just weirdness that comes through. But with this said, I get a little red apple too. So I'm kind of going down this rabbit hole of things that maybe because one thing leads to another, and I think I'm smelling these things, but a little bit of clove, a little bit of cinnamon. So, you know, there's definitely some oak influence, two to four years. So a two year old oak can it definitely impart some flavors and aromas. At three years, we start getting into that neutral barrel um, type of thing. Not that you can't get anything from a three-year-old barrel, but it's pretty limited what you're going to get from a three-year-old barrel. And definitely four you know, older, it's really just a vessel and may provide some oxidation. Some forest floor, some dirt, but it's more fruit than anything else, okay? So there's this preponderance of fruit, more black fruit now, like blackberry, uh, some raspberry, some blueberry. This is where for a lot of, for a lot of Ribetta del Duero wines, for me, they come across like Cabernet Sauvignon. This comes across more like a left bank Bordeaux than necessarily American Cab, but there is a, a kind of a almost new world quality to it, but it's like feet are plant, firmly planted in both worlds. But I will say that a lot of Ribetta, and this doesn't, again, this is not using a ton of new oak, um, but Ribetta uses a lot of new oak, uh, especially if it's French oak, um, will very much come across as like Napa Cab. And it'll look like Napa Cab. It'll smell and taste like Napa Cab. I've called it Napa Cab in, in, in blinds. This is similar, but it has some earthiness and some rusticity that I don't associate with California or with New World wine. So it's delicious. Yeah, you got the cinnamon, you got the clove, the blackberry, raspberry, cranberry, not so much cranberry, uh, a little strawberry, earthiness, a little bit of garage, uh, nettle, bramble, you know, those types of descriptors. Yeah, 
it's tasty. I mean, it's a thirty dollar bottle of wine, and I, I, yeah, I agree, it's thirty bucks. It's tasty. If you can find this wine, you should get it. All right. So um, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell your friends. And we'll see you next time. And I don't know what's coming next. Uh, it might be my Texas Restaurant Association stuff. It may be my interview with Jennifer Beckman at Rerooted. It may be more wine. I don't know, but we'll see you next time.